We begin this service in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. The psalmist says in Psalm 117, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. We'll sing our opening hymn, Praise 2. Sing to the Lord who reigns above. now enter into a time of confession, thanksgiving, and intercession. We want to confess our sins as a nation and as a church. We want to come before God in humility and tell him of how we've fallen low of his standards. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But we thank you for your word that says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just 
to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we come, Lord, first as individuals. We confess our sense of prayerlessness. We confess our sense of addiction to other things, the things of the world. We confess our sense that we have not spent time reading and studying and meditating on your words, but rather we have allowed the world to fail our minds. We pray that you will forgive us. Forgive us for not showing enough kindness to people if we have bothered to show kindness at all. Forgive us for our preoccupation with ourselves and our needs and our problems. When, Lord Jesus, even when you were hanging on the cross, you thought of your mother, you thought of us, you thought of the world. We pray that you forgive us. We bring before you the sins of the church. Lord, the church has failed to be as bright a light as you created it to be. The sins of the world we found in the church, the greed and selfishness and the arrogance, the church is guilty of it. And so we pray that you will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and help us to fulfill the purpose for which you set up the church, to be light to the world and salt on this earth. We also want to for pray for our sins and ask for forgiveness as a nation. Lord God Almighty, if you don't look on us in pity, there will be nothing left of us. We confess the sense of indiscipline. We confess, O oh Lord, the sense of occultism and greed and dishonesty and corruption. Father, we pray that you forgive us from our leaders to the person in prison. May your grace wash us Lord Jesus, may your blood during this Lent time wash us clean and look on us with mercy. We thank you that we can count on you to forgive us because your name is faithful and true. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now we would ask Reverend Kumson to come and lead us in prayers of thanksgiving for all the manifold mercies that the Lord has bestowed upon us. I want to spend some time thanking God for his mighty intervention. I want to thank him that but for his grace, things would have been worse. I want to thank God for his faithfulness in preserving us, not giving us what we deserve. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to give you praise and glory. Because your word says that in all things we should give you thanks. For that is your will concerning us. Father, we acknowledge that this is a difficult situation. But in the midst of this, we also acknowledge that it is your mercies which hasn't allowed the, this world to be totally destroyed. So I want to say thank you. Thank you, O oh God, for all the people who have recovered from this coronavirus. Father, I want to praise you and adore you in the name of Jesus. I want to thank you so much, Lord, for the wisdom you have given to doctors, wisdom you have given to scientists and researchers, and the progress that has been made so far towards finding a cure for this coronavirus. Father, I want to say thank you. I want to thank you so much, Lord, in the name of Jesus, for all the mighty things you have done in our world in the midst of this coronavirus. Thank you that, Lord, people are beginning to turn to you. Thank you, Lord, that hearts are being opened to you. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation of those who have been saved. I want to say thank you. And I want to thank you that, Lord God, at the end of this whole period, your glory shall shine forth. The pride of man shall be subdued that the glory of Jesus Christ shall shine forth. Father, I want to bless you, Lord, even as a nation, that, Lord God, 
you have preserved us and kept us up to this point. This is a confidence we have in you. That having begun with us, Lord, you bring it to a perfect end. And even before that happens, we want to say thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. We'll invite Reverend Buama to lead us in a time of intercession. At this time, we would like to pray for our nation. Petition the Lord to have mercy on us. Heal our land, heal our people. Let us begin by asking the Lord to heal our hearts individually and corporately from the greed that continues to hold fast on our hearts, even at this time. Why should prices double and triple and quadruple at this time? Why should people cash in on this situation? Please pray that the Lord himself will heal the hearts of our people at this time. That we shall be one another's keeper and few for one another at this time. Please pray that the Lord will give our leaders wisdom and knowledge and insight and understanding at this time into this situation, into this pandemic, and take such decisions as will benefit all of us, make life easier for the multitude of our people. Ask that the Lord himself will provide everything that is needed so that all our needs can be provided at this time. The government may need to source supplies from different countries at this time. Please pray that the supplies will come in on time, test the equipment, medication, etc., without any hitch whatsoever, so that whatever is needed will be found at the right time, at the right place. At this time, some people are supplying fake medication, fake testing equipment, fake sanitizers and what have you. Please ask that the Lord will provide, protect us from all such quack people, such con people in this time of difficulty. So our loving Father, we look up to you, trusting that you will help us in this time. Help our leaders to help us. Guide them to guide us. Father, we pray that you protect especially all the medical personnel who are supporting and helping those who are terribly in need, the sick, the dying. Protect them from any kind of infection so that they'll be strong and healthy and able to support those who need help. Guide all of us away from greed and take advantage of the situation Give us hearts that feel for one another. Give us grace to be there for one another. And Father, we pray that you continue to protect the larger population from any kind of infection, community infection, that can go on. Help us be wise in the way we apply the rules, in the way we follow instructions, so that we shall wash our hands when we need to. When we are coughing or sneezing, we shall do it appropriately and be mindful of the needs of those who are close to us and dear to us. We thank you so much, Father, that you are there for us. You help us, you answer us, and make our joy in you complete, even through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you in his precious name. Amen. Before we enter a time of adoration and praise, we want to continue with the prayer for people with special needs. So wherever you are, if there's a burden on your heart, whether it's fear, uncertainty, sickness, whatever it is that's bothering you, let us bow down our heads. Or you can rise up wherever you are and let's bring our petitions before the Lord.
David said, many are the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. And so we want to pray, asking the Lord that because he has put on us the righteousness of Jesus, he will look on us with mercy and pity and hear our prayer. Father, we pray that you read our hearts and know our unspoken prayers. We are pleading, Lord, for those of our members who are afraid. We pray that we will look up to you so that faith in you will displace fear in our hearts. We pray for those who are sick. Lord, these are trying times. The hospitals are getting ready for more serious cases, but things that affect us could get neglected. We plead for your healing hand, Lord. Keep us safe, keep us healthy, keep us well during these times. We pray for those who are afraid of job losses or people who have already lost their jobs. Heavenly Father, have mercy. Help us to trust you and lay on our hearts how we can help one another. Hold each other's hands for support through these trying times. We also want to pray for homes where there's no harmony. Lord God, this is the time for us to bind together. May your grace and your mercy hold us together. Help us to forgive one another and live in love even as you have asked us to. We thank you, Lord, that you do much more than we ask because we've asked in Jesus' name. Amen. Now is the time for adoration and praise. We want to focus on God and bring him pleasure. And then we want to raise his name on high and praise him. Oh, 
have a very big God who is always by our side. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, Lord, thank you so much for giving us to come and give. Father, use everything to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. And shall we kick off? At this time, we'll have a song ministration by the music ministry. In the name of the Lord, because the Lord indeed is worthy. Do you feel the world is broken? It is. Do you feel the shadows deepen? It is. dark won't stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all made new 
scripture readings. Our first Bible reading for today is taken from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and verse 7. 
Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and verse 7. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Let's hear the word of God. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. Our second Bible reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, and then 17 to 27. John's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, and then 17 to 27. Let's hear the word of God. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. We continue from verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Here ends the reading. Can we go before the Lord in prayer as we hear the voice of the Lord this morning? So Father, here we stand, here we sit at your feet to be instructed. You have the words of eternal life. We have tasted of these words and we have known that it is in you alone we have life. Therefore, to whom shall we go? We have no one to turn to but to you confusion and difficulty, this is where we need you the most, and we thank you you have ever been present. So speak to us, give us life and strength through your word this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we want to bless the Lord for life and strength. We speak on a very important subject, Jesus the believer's strength. Jesus, the believer's strength. Our focus will be on the passage, our second passage, which was from the book of John, chapter 11, the popular story of the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. 
I've actually noticed in life that there are a number of times when we hit a place of weakness, a place where we are broken, a place where we are tired, a place where it looks hopeless. Amazingly, certain situations simply seem to come on the scene that seem to spark some fresh strength and energy in us to give us a reason to move on. And, and I'll give us some very, very simple examples. Thank God we are in the season of Lent. And I realize it is very true when it comes to even fasting, especially when you go on a long fast. You feel very tired and weak, sometimes even as early as 9 a.m., the enzymes and whatever begin to tell you that you cannot go the whole day. And so when you have journeyed through all the day till about 5 p.m., amazingly you begin to realize that when you are just at the verge of taking that your porridge you are prepared, some new strength seems to come into your body. And I've experienced this on longer fast. First day is manageable, second day is so stressful, the third day you have to break your fast. Just before you break your fast, it begins to seem as if, I think I can even do a fourth day. Where does that strength immediately come from? It shows one thing about life. When we see a certain desired presence in view, it seems to inject some energy into us. This is the food that will give me strength. This is the food I've stayed away for all the three days. When you have it in view, it brings a certain energy into you. So even before you eat, strength already begins to come into you because you have sighted food. I see the end in view. I remember some time back here, I think that was level 200 or 300. And now Abigail is my wife, but then we were very close friends. She was, we are not even in a relationship. And I remember we going for a prayer meeting. And somewhere, somehow, I didn't feel at home at all in the prayer meeting. My spirit is not really at the level I wanted to be in prayer. You know the usual thing about praying and feeling that you've really communicated with the Lord. My spirit was down. I was only talking and I knew the thing was not coming from within. And the question was, what is really wrong with me today? Of course, one thing I had noticed was that Abigail was not present at the prayer meeting. This was a close friend. She's always been at this prayer meeting week in, week out. Now, I noticed a difference immediately I saw coming from the Legon Hall and next B area, we're praying on the Sabbath field, and I saw her approaching. Beloved in the Lord, interestingly, a certain new energy, enthusiasm that entered into me, I became surprised at my own self. So all this while, the way I was feeling in the prayer meeting was simply because a certain desired presence was not there. Somebody who mattered to me and had mattered in all the prayer meetings I had not really taken notice of was not present that day and so it had affected my enthusiasm in prayer and upon the person approaching alone, energy entered into me. Sometimes we are at our best in life, not because we are the most disciplined. Sometimes we are at our best in life because we have the right environment and the right people around us to challenge us to go beyond our limits. And this seems to be the situation we see in John chapter 11. Today, my focus is not on Jesus' miracle. My focus is on the two sisters. The, their attitude in this particular passage speaks a lot about the strength we gain, the strength that is generated from the presence of Jesus in our lives. And of course, in a season like this, and I'm trusting the Lord that at the end of this message, every one of us will receive new strength in the face of our fears, in the face of our weaknesses, in the face of COVID-19. So let's look at the life of Mary and Martha in the face of their sorrow. And I want to paint a few things to show us the reality that these ladies lived in. What was the reality of their lives in John chapter 11? We notice in the first place that their own brother, Lazarus, was dead. 
Now you can understand in that cultural setting, a patriarchal society, what it meant for a father or a brother to die. Of course, we cannot conjecture. We don't know where he, their parents were, but we only keep hearing about the three of them. The presence of a man in that family was gone. The brother was dead. Not just that, the brother had died, and yet a friend who had the ability to have saved their brother from dying did not show up when he was needed. This was also part of their reality. And so when they met Jesus, both Mary and Martha, as if they had rehearsed it, all of them spoke to the Lord and said, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. They knew that Jesus had the solution to saving their brother. So this is not just somebody who is dying out of a hopeless situation. This is somebody dying out of a situation where a close friend who had the ability to have saved him decided not to show up. Mm. That's not all their reality. Let's still look closer. We'll see the reality of ladies who were in deep mourning. Of course, the gentleman had been buried for four days. It's not like a Ghanaian context where you can be in the morgue for two months, so when you have been buried after four days, that's a long time after you had died. This seems to be a cultural context where it is like the Muslims, you are buried right after you die. And so after four days, it was still fresh. The sisters were in deep mourning. But that was not all their reality. They had another reality where they did not lack company. People were present to console them. So they had lost a brother. A friend who could have saved the brother didn't show up. They were in deep sorrow and pain. And they had had people who had come around to sympathize with them. In fact, we are told that Bethany is just about two miles away from Jerusalem, the capital, to the Jews. And so people from the capital had come to console them. However, in the midst of this, their reality, we begin to see something about a new strength that seems to have come into them upon hearing that Jesus was coming. And this is my focus for the message. In pain, in sorrow, the friend dejected you. But above all, you have a lot of people around you to at least console you. But check the way they behaved in the midst of these realities. The Bible says that Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, moved out of the house and went and met Jesus. Whoa, that is interesting. Now, why is that interesting? In the case of Mary, it is Martha that went to Mary and said that Jesus is coming. He's saying that he wants to see you. In the case of Martha, nobody told Martha that Jesus is calling you. When she heard that Jesus was approaching, she herself moved out of the house to go and meet him. Let's put it into context. What is supposed to actually happen? You are the one that is bereaved. You are the one that is grieving. You are the one that are visitors from the capital, Jerusalem, sitting around you and consoling you. If somebody is coming to me because I've lost my brother, the person will have to show Ketsi, enter the home, do the handshaking in the typical account context, and then say that what happened? Obama, near fine. That's what we know, isn't it? But in this situation, the one to be consoled is the one who leaves the house to go meet the one who is coming to console her at the outskirts of town. It's amazing. It's amazing. Let's look even closer. And we see that more even with Mary's life too. In the verse number 31, John chapter 11, verse number 39. 31. He says that then the Jews who were with her in the house, and he's speaking about Mary, and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly, check that qualification there, she rose up in haste, she rose up quickly, this is a morning person, she rises up quickly, quickly to who? To the very person who decided not to show up when they were in trouble. 
to the very person who decided to ignore their brother when he had the ability to have saved him. She rose up quickly and went out. And then the crowd, they followed her saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. So they followed her. 32 says, then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. This is not the core aspect of this passage, but amazingly, this seems to be what speaks so much to me as a person. Martha moves quickly as soon as she hears. And when you read and the Bible says that Mary met Jesus at the same place Martha met Jesus before he had entered into the village. Jesus is coming and those to be comforted do not stay in their home for Jesus to enter. They rather quickly move out to go and meet Jesus at the outskirts. Fall at Jesus' feet, bow to him and then begin to pour their hearts. Where is this energy coming from that will cause women that are mourning to rise up and say, we are not waiting for this person to come in to speak to us. We are going to confront, speak to him there. Who is he in their lives? How important is this person coming to them? How special is he? What relationship does he have with them that they cannot wait for Jesus to enter their home? They must meet Jesus even before he enters Bethany and express to him how they feel. Beloved in the Lord, it is the same thing to us. The strength we can generate from Jesus, his presence, hearing that he's approaching, can be just as we saw in the lives of these sisters. The strength of the Lord is at work in your life. When about hearing of him, hearing his name, hearing of his presence, knowing of his presence, moves you onto urgent action. And that was what happened to the sister. She quickly moves out. She was in haste. Whenever you hear of the presence, the name, the work of the Lord, then it moves you into urgent action. It tells you that a certain external strength and grace from him has been injected into you for you to act. When we are so lackadaisical with the, the, the Lord and the things that relate to him, it tells us how much strength, motivation we are generating from him. No matter how much I am in sorrow, I gather myself in strength to run to the outskirts to meet the master because he means a lot to me. Upon hearing his coming alone is sufficient strength to me to rise up from my crying bed and to go meet him at the outskirts. You have assessed the strength in the Lord Jesus when upon hearing of him, it stirs a spark in you even when you are down, even when you are afraid even when you are sorrowful. It happens when you still rush to his feet, even though you think the situation might be irreversible. I remember this was the situation of the sisters. These were not people who were going to Jesus to come and raise Lazarus up because it had to take Jesus to speak to them a lot to have faith that he will come to life immediately and not in the resurrection. So they thought this situation is irreversible. The guy is dead. Yet, they went to Jesus, not because he was going to raise their brother up, but because upon hearing of him alone, gives a certain energy to them to rise up and go and meet the master. So what is your situation? You lost a son, you lost a brother, irreversible, buried, dead, gone, long ago. Yet, even in the midst of an irreversible situation, your ability to rise up and fall at his feet shows how much his name gives strength and energy to your soul. He becomes strength to you when you know that even when the worst happens, you will still live again. And was that not what Jesus said? I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you shall never die. Even if you die, you will live again. That gives strength to us. God forbid COVID-19 will not kill any of us. But what if it did? 
Praise be to God. That will not be the end of our lives. And that gives us reason to hope in God and not to be overly afraid because we know that Jesus is the resurrection in life. Let me put down this mortal body and I still have hope that I will live with him again. That is the faith of a Christian church. And I read yesterday about a, an article that had been written about the, the influenza, the Spanish influenza that happened in 1918 and how the church then, the Assemblies of God church then picked up this matter. The Lord healed many and yet a good number of them also passed. And yet the way they interpreted even the passing of the believers was a lot of encouragement to show you that for the Christian, when storm is blowing everybody away, we always think and say, even when the worst happens, Jesus is still the resurrection and the life. Even if I am to pass, praise be to God, I have hope of living with the Lord at the next side of life. That is strength to your soul. That is strength to your body. Now, let me, let's quickly look and, and climax. So why does the presence of Jesus stir up so much strength in a person? How did, why is it that the coming of Jesus onto the scene could let women that were mourning move out of the estate to run all the way to the outskirts to welcome a guest? Why does his presence bring strength? Number one, his presence is strength. His name is strength. His personality is strength because he is a lover. <laughs> because he loves. Look at the verse 3 and the verse 5. He said, therefore the sister sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Great emphasis. Because of his love, and they had experienced this love, that's why the sisters could say that in their statement to him. They didn't say Lazarus is sick. They didn't say our brother is sick. They said that the one you love is sick. That is significant. It had become so evident for everybody to know that this man, he is known for his ability to love the people that come to him. And they knew it. And we see it all through the passage. Even to the extent of the verse 8, if you read the verse 8, check the way Jesus had actually decided to risk his life. When he said, let us go to Judea, the disciples said to him in verse 8, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? So even Jesus deciding to go back to Bethany it was a risk to his life. Who takes risks for others except the one who loves you? Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his own life for his friends. Mary and Martha knew this. He has shown this to us in our lives. We know it. And that's why we can call him a lover of our brother. And therefore, when we hear he's approaching, we are quick to go and welcome him because he's a lover. Secondly, his presence brings strength to us because he identifies with his own. He doesn't just love us. He doesn't just do things for us, but he identifies with us. One of my biggest questions about John 11 is the shortest verse in scripture. Jesus wept. Why will you weep when you actually intentionally waited for him to die because you knew you would resurrect the guy? Why do you weep when you know that in the next few minutes from now, this guy who is in the tomb is going to rise up? Why do you weep? Was he faking it? No. When he wept, the people could interpret. Check how much he loved him. What is this to us? It is to tell us that Jesus, when he walked on the earth, identified with our weaknesses, even when he was going to deal with it. Beloved in the Lord, wherever you are staying and whatever you are going through, come to understand that your pain, Jesus identifies with it. When you are broke, Jesus identifies with it. When you are afraid, Jesus identifies with it. If you ever had an idea what he does to you when you are in that broken state, you encourage yourself and know that the Lord has not forgotten about you. He weeps alongside you. 
and wishes that you are out of this sooner than you ever think. He identifies with his own and that is why in his presence, his own gains strength. This is somebody who understands us. Hebrews 4.15, you can read that for yourself. A high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Finally, his presence stirs up strength in us because he brings hope even after the tears. Oh, he brings hope even after the tears. We have wept four days, but praise be to God, I am here on the fourth day. We have done all the weeping, but here I am on the fourth day. He is a game changer. And Mary and Martha knew this. So Martha said, well, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even whatever you ask of God now, he's able to give it to you. They knew they were dealing with a game changer. Whenever Jesus is on the scene, he brings hope. Is that the way Jesus is to you in the midst of COVID-19? And how this message will be far relevant even beyond COVID-19. Because some of us, our biggest challenge now in our homes is not COVID-19. But that marriage that is on the rocks. That financial crisis. Will you still let this message speak to you that when Jesus is on the scene, even after the tears, he still brings hope? So to climax... What is the Lord telling us today? His message is a message of hope, bringing us strength. That don't just gain strength from food, don't just gain strength from encouraging words of men, don't just gain strength from the medical staff, but gain strength from the fact that Jesus is right here with you. Upon hearing of his presence, let it ginger you. Clean your face, wipe your face. Stop the tears. Because somebody is here to change the game. His name and his presence makes us live on. He is the counselor in our first reading. He is an everlasting father. He knows how to hold the sons and daughters and comfort them out of their pain. I love this name. He is the prince of peace. Bible says that of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. You have tried the God of power. You have tried the God of love. Will you want to try the God of peace? His name and his presence makes us live on because he counsels us, he fathers us, he brings us peace, he gives us hope to push on in life. It makes us cry, but cry in hope. We do not mourn like the unbelieving. It makes us say that even after four days of death, we can live again. It makes us realize that we are people who are for signs and for wonders. And I declare today in your home, wherever you might find yourself, let that same presence of Jesus that brought a miracle to the household of Mary and Martha bring a miracle to your house today in the name of Jesus. Let a certain resurrection take place in your health, in your finances, in your children, in your marriage, and in everything that pertains to you. Let resurrection happen because the game changer is right there with you. So what do we do today? Rise up. Rise up to the reality that he is present with you. In the case of Mary and Martha, he had delayed for four days. They waited for him. In our case, praise be to God. We don't need to wait for him. He's already with us. So rise up to the reality that he has not traveled. Rise up to the reality that he's not on his way. He's right there in your room with you. Only if you will believe, he said, you shall see the glory of God. How I pray that this brief message will bring strength to somebody who is weak today and say that Jesus' name and presence alone a sufficient source of strength and encouragement for me, no matter what I'm going through. Can we go before the Lord in prayer? And respond to this briefly. And tell the Lord, the Lord, other things have put me down, but I think it is time for something to lift me up again. Something to cause a spark of glow, a spark of joy, a spark of hope, 
in my soul again. And I know there's nothing that can do that but you, Jesus, your presence, your name. Because you are my lover, you identify with me, and you bring hope to me. So Father, thank you for today. Thank you for these words of life. May it be that when people are being casted down left, right, center, we will still stand strong because we hold on to Jesus. He that is our eternal strength. May we embrace the fact that you are a counselor, you are a father, and you are peace. Your name be praised in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. We thank God for using Reverend Jaban to speak, speak to us and bring us these encouraging words. We will sing our closing hymn, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds in a Believer's Ear. It's now time for the benediction, and we ask Reverend Jabba to give us the closing prayer and benediction. Can we rise wherever we might be to receive the blessings of the Lord? The sovereign Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth, the Lord bless you and keep you. Jehovah God, may his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and grant you that peace that passes all understanding. Strength and peace to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week.